Okay, here we see a LP Gas International 650 tractor. Now, it may be such that the farmer is using large quantities of that liquefied petroleum gas, possibly for obviously heating or maybe even some operations on his farm. And uh, he would like to also use that fuel for his tractor. So here we have a way to do that. And as you'll notice there, as we look in place of the carburetor, this is actually where I am measuring airflow and proportioning a corresponding quantity of gas. And uh, this is strictly just a, a volumetric metering system. The more air is the, the more corresponding quantity of, uh, of gas. Now, um, liquid petroleum gas is explosive and runs in an engine over a fairly wide range. It's not quite as fussy as gasoline, but obviously for good fuel economy and good performance, I want to keep it within its stoichiometric window. And it's um, uh, one thing you notice that when you're buying liquid petroleum gas is that it takes about two gallons of the liquefied gas in liquid form to go the same distance as a gallon of gasoline. So there's less energy in a liquefied volume compared to gasoline. And then, of course, the same thing with diesel. I go further with the diesel engine, not only because of the way it works, but also because there's more energy in a gallon of diesel fuel than a gallon of gasoline. But here, I'm using the liquid uh, fired petroleum gas for something else on my farm. So this is great. I mean, now I can use it in my tractor. So there we see the uh, fill and vent port. And uh, let's get up closer and take a look at the fuel regulator. Now, um, here we see the fuel regulator. Now remember that my pressurized gas is coming in at high pressure. Now these lines here, this is actually engine coolant because what happens is I go from a liquid state, notice my little bitty line there coming in. Let me see, here's the line, yep. Okay, here's the gas line coming from the tank. So here we have the liquid gas. This is engine coolant, engine coolant. And here we have, of course, the hopefully vaporized gas that's gonna be introduced here at my mixture control. I have a throttle valve that's being controlled by this governor. Now, I don't need any type of choke here, but what happens is in order for this to effectively vaporize this liquid petroleum gas, I need some heat energy. And when I initially start the engine, I don't have that. So sometimes this thing can get real frosty, but once the engine starts and starts uh, circulating warm coolant, then that's not a problem. And uh, one thing that's interesting, if you're operating a internal combustion on this liquefied petroleum gas, you'll notice that the spark plugs after 30, 40, 50, 60,000 miles, several years of operation, you take them out and they look like just about what you, they're as clean as what you took out of the box. They're absolutely spotless. You don't see any uh, carbon or uh, uh, deposits on them almost at all. Now, of course, obviously, the electrodes will still wear, especially with the uh, ignition arc, but as far as the cleanliness of the porcelain insulator, it's just spotless. Also, the same thing with the engine oil. Even after an extended period of operation, you check the, clear, the quality of the oil, the clarity of the oil, and it looks like you just about took it out of the bottle. So, there, it uh, keeps things in the engine certainly nice and clean. Okay, here we see a battery style ignition system with a breaker point distributor, a centrifugal advance. Here's my tack lead. This is for my tachometer. And here I have a hydraulic pump. So what I'm doing is that I'm uh, pressurizing hydraulic fluid using it for uh, different uh, operations here on the tractor. I can use it to lift my plow. And if I have it, I can also uh, use it for a type of power or hydraulic assist steering. All right, here we see a little bit of a customized diesel tractor. This is a 1962 Massey Ferguson. And uh, here we have an inline six cylinder diesel engine. This is a little different from what we looked at before. Here I'm looking at a Rusa Master. This is made by Stanadyne, and you'll recognize the name Stanadyne. They make plumbing fixtures also, but this is their diesel injector pump, 
This is their Ruza Master six cylinder diesel injector pump. And this is an interesting style. This is actually a um, rotary style pump. It actually has a set of plungers and rollers that are driven within a cam mechanism. And by the way, that cam mechanism can be shifted back and forth hydraulically to adjust injection timing. So there, as the engine speeds up, I can advance the instant of injection. And uh, I have a clever little valve assembly that's combined with the governor as a centripetal weight style governor that's gonna regulate the filling of the chamber between the two plungers to control the quantity of fuel injected. So here I can control the actual engine speed. They're at idle and full load. Now, um, this is actually a I believe that this was supposed to be the fuel shutoff solenoid. So where's my fuel shutoff? All right, that's a good question right there. We'll move up here, let's take a look. On the standard ion injector pump, the little Rusa Master, it has a little vein type transfer pump. And if the fuel tank is above the level of the injector pump, this is the only supply pump that I need. And what does this little vein type pump do? It just supplies liquid diesel fuel into this housing. Now it supplies a large quantity of diesel fuel, more than would ever be injected. So I'm constantly going in a circle. Here's the return line going back to the tank. So what's happening is I'm cooling and lubricating the injector pump with diesel fuel. So what happens, I might have a hot engine, but don't worry, the, um, uh, the fuel tank has plenty of diesel fuel in it and I'm continuously warming it. So I got a beautiful hit heat sink. So here I can use diesel fuel to cool and lubricate my injector pump. Now the actual high pressure fuel that's uh, high pressure developed between the plungers is as of course the rotor is coming into synchronization with the corresponding port is directed to the corresponding injector. And here we see our injectors. And these are usually pencil style injectors and they do have a little bleed off all the time. And uh, what happens is what I mean by that is the quantity of fuel delivered under pressure, hopefully the majority of it is injected into the cylinder, but some leaks past the uh, pencil and spring assembly and then just simply returns back to the fuel tank. In fact, here I see a common return block right here. So here we see the return coming from um, from the injector pump. And uh, what's happening here, we see it joining to the bleed off from the injectors and then going right back to the tank. Now, obviously, with any diesel engine and injector equipment, I want a supply of nice, clean, water-free diesel fuel. And as you can see, I have a no-nonsense diesel fuel filter there. And I do not see a secondary filter. I'm just using one primary filter. Looks like this is the only one that I'm using. Yep, yeah, just one primary filter. Here's my water drain. Let's go ahead and take a look at our oil filter housing. Two probably identical automotive style oil filters. And here I have a hydraulic pump. And it's being used for the power steering and uh, probably some additional auxiliaries on the vehicle. Now, as I look over here to our right, we do see a, tw a 12 volt battery. There we see, remember it's 2.1 volts per cell. And so how many cells do I have there? Six cells. So this is a 12 volt battery. And you can see this is a rather unique um, uh, battery configuration, probably not to the agricultural industry, but at least to the automotive. Long, slim, tall battery with the terminals close together. Okay, here we see a Delco Remy alternator. And actually this alternator does have an electronic voltage regulator, but what happens is this is one of those marine style alternators. Now what in the world am I talking about? That has no external connection except going to the battery and vehicle electrical system. Now remember, the voltage regulator is electronic. It's actually built in there to the alternator. This is just simply a ground connection. And uh, I do believe, can I say this is 
the correct alternator for this vehicle? If this is a 1962, I'm going to say no. I'm going to deduct points. What happens is this is a much later alternator and not really applicable to this era. Okay, here we see the starter motor, and that's a no-nonsense starter motor. Take a look at the cables right here. This is the ground cable, and actually what happens is I have two large cables in parallel connecting to the starter solenoid. This is a 12-volt unit, and uh, probably what happens during an initial cranking, it's uh, 12 volts at probably 400 amps. So we're looking at... Uh, Probably almost five horsepower right there to crank this engine. Now we saw the battery on one side. This is your second battery. And that's not uncommon for diesel engines that need two batteries. And as you can see, negative to negative, positive to positive. Oftentimes this is in parallel. I know that some heavy duty trucks will use series parallel. They use a series giving it 24 volts for cranking and then drop back to 12 volts for the charging and electrical system. But I think this is just strictly a parallel system. Okay, here we're seeing a um, uh, Oliver Super 99 diesel two cycle engine. Yes, this is a Detroit diesel two cycle engine. Let's get a little closer and take a look. Okay, here we see our General Motors two-cycle diesel engine. Now this is a three-cylinder diesel engine, two-cycle. And of course, one of the features of our two-cycle engine is that I have to have an air box that's pressurized with a roots blower. And this roots blower, of course, is driven through a gear train by the crankshaft of the engine. And what it's going to do is we're going to bring in fresh air from the air cleaner and we're pressurizing it considerably above atmospheric. Now that's extremely important because the way this two cycle diesel engine is designed is the pistons coming down on the power stroke. The first thing that's going to happen is conventional poppet style exhaust valves are going to open and they're going to vent the cylinder and then as it piston comes down a little further, it opens the air box ports with the exhaust valves still open. So this pressurized air will be forced in through the ports at the bottom of the cylinder liner and help purge the exhaust from the cylinder. The exhaust valves will close, the piston will come up on the compression stroke, cover up the air box ports, compress that air to a very high pressure and high temperature. I'm going to inject diesel fuel with a unit type mechanical injector and then there we have a corresponding um, compression ignition and explosion driving the piston down and the process repeats. Now what happens as you can see with this design is the piston has a power stroke every crankshaft rotation so it's truly a true si two cycle engine. So the idea is three cylinders supposedly are equivalent to what six cylinders on a four cycle this was dubbed of the tractor of its kind the most powerful available in that year and this is 1955 so this is a two cycle diesel engine now as we look at it here we see the intake and the roots blower and this is actually the exhaust manifold and uh, here I'm coming up to the exhaust pipe and that's a straight pipe I bet this thing was noisy and one thing about this, if you're out in the field working all day, the last thing you need is a noisy tractor. Okay, here we see some of the auxiliaries driven by the front of the blower assembly. Remember, the blower is driven by a gear train off the crankshaft. Is that um, this is the governor assembly? So, this is a centrifugal governor assembly, and this is the water pump. So, here we see the water pump. And here we see the governor drive where the governor assembly is up here on top. Okay, here we see the air box ports. What happens is these are a nice feature. I can go ahead and remove these and I can actually inspect the air box and I'll actually see the, um, uh, the crown of the piston and actually can look at the condition of the rings as I bar the engine over. 
Now, the question is, if I remove this port right here, and especially if the engine's warm, can I crank and start the engine? Ah, yes, you can. However, be careful, because what happens, you're gonna get a blast of air from the blower, and what happens, you're not gonna be purging the cylinder prop properly, so you're gonna get a shot of exhaust as I uncover the airbox ports. But um, uh, what happens, the exhaust valves are open, obviously, but remember, that um, uh, the other cylinders that you do not have the, uh, well, I guess this is actually common, I should say. I believe this is actually common. I don't know, is the air box common on this style? Uh, but yes, you can conceivably start the engine with an air box cover off. And what I mean by common, is the air box common to all cylinders or am I coming off individual ports there beyond the roots blower? And of course, we'd have to talk about how this block was designed with the cylinders. I need to have plenty of coolant flow around the cylinders to keep them cool, but I have to expose the bottom there so that I can get to the lower ports. The Detroit diesel two-cycle diesel engine was a very, very popular engine. It was used for many years. Now, obviously, on a modern Detroit diesel, remember that Detroit sold out to Daimler. So Daimler-Benz, Mercedes, yes, Daimler. The Detroit diesel, the DD15, is a four-cycle, turbocharged, common rail diesel, all electronically controlled, but that's uh, actually made by a uh, European company now. Back in 1955, this was all American, and you could argue that the majority of components on this diesel engine, on, on this tractor itself, are obviously all made in America, but you could say, hey, we're just maybe within a few hundred miles of the factory. Here we're getting more high tech. This is a generator. I noticed that this has all three terminals, so I have the, um, uh, the, uh, the, 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 one of these is going to be, here's, here's the battery, so this is going to be the reverse relay terminal. And then I'm going to have the um, uh, voltage regulator and I'm going to have the current regulator. So here we see the output of the generator. One of these is going to be the field terminal, one of them uh, field terminal, one of them is going to be the output terminal. And you say, well, is that wire big enough? Gosh, look at that. Look at the wire on the starter motor. Look at the wires here on the generator. This generator only produces about 20 or 30 amps max, that's it. So here the starter motor during an initial crank on a cold winter day is gonna be probably pulling 400 amps. And we can say that the battery voltage, if it was 12 volts, would probably drop down to about 10 volts. So there you see 400 amps, 10 volts, that's 4,000 watts and about 750 watts is a horsepower. So you can see it's almost five horsepower. It is, five horsepower. There we go. To crank this diesel engine. Now, as far as a cold starting aid on a Detroit, let's go around to the other side and look at the intake manifold briefly. Now, one thing about the two-cycle diesel engine, What's happening is that the roots blower is bolted right to the side of the engine, right to the air box. And I want to be careful because if I'm spraying ether or some type of very flammable material into a Detroit as a cold starting aid, you want to be careful because if I, for some reason that ignites, that can really cause a severe problem. Okay, here you see the air cleaner assembly and this is truly an oil bath air cleaner. Here you see oil level, and it's gonna have a fibrous type of material. Oftentimes they call it horsehair, but that's sometimes what they really used. And it's just talking about the servicing of the air cleaner. Obviously, if you're in a very clean environment, this can go a long period without servicing, but obviously operating in a very dusty environment, that's going to be a problem. So here, as the air comes in through the air cleaner, it's going right off to the inlet of the roots blower. So we mentioned here with the Detroit, you want to be real careful about any type of starting aids. I don't see any type of starting aid, so really what I'm depending upon is I can still start the coldest diesel engine with a corresponding 
starter motor. So just simply crank that engine over and every time that piston comes up on a compression stroke, we're putting tremendous work into the engine, compressing that air, raising its temperature and warming up that cylinder. Okay, here we are just south of Richmond, Virginia. And uh, Richmond, Virginia is the home of Philip Morris. And uh, Richmond, uh, Philip Morris's plant is in Chesterfield County. I believe it's in Chesterfield County. I don't think we're in the city of Richmond. We're definitely south of the uh, James River. But here we're taking a look at some of the brands of uh, Philip Morris. Now, some of these are uh, brands that belong to, uh, um, like for instance, Salem, of course, obviously, that's not Philip Morris. But many of these brands are Philip Morris, and that was the one thing that uh, was very popular and kind of put Virginia on the map, per se, was tobacco. Tobacco was a very desirable product that was uh, sent back to England there with the original colonists. And Maryland, Virginia tobacco, North Carolina tobacco is some of the best tobacco in the world for making cigarettes. And even though it's not talked about much, or you certainly don't see any advertising, Philip Morris Altria, as they changed their name to, is still alive and well and has a major plant here just south of Richmond that manufactures cigarettes not only for the United States but also for the world. Back in the day Porsche was known for uh, farm tractors and this is an example of a Porsche diesel farm tractor. Now, obviously this is a European tractor that's found its way here to uh, uh, Chesterfield, Virginia, but there we see it, a Porsche diesel. So here it is, the 1957 Porsche P111, and uh, supposedly 125,000 of these tractors were produced, and they're a very nice looking tractor. I have never actually seen one in operation, but obviously over in Germany, this is going to be the most popular tractor that they used in that era. Okay, here we see the Cockshut Deluxe 50 tractor. This is a gasoline tractor, and you'll notice that uh, Delco Remy alternator there on the tractor. And as we go down the line, of these different tractors. The next one in line actually has a Mopar or Chrysler alternator. And then finally, as we go to the third one in the row, that looks right. That has the classic generator. And remember, this is 1947. So obviously in the 1940s and 50s, the automotive alternator had not been developed yet. A high current, low cost semiconductor diode had really not been developed and was not affordable. So the classic tractors were built obviously with the automotive generator, but apparently it might be hard to get a generator or the generators weren't real high current and real reliable, required a lot of maintenance. So you can see a lot of people have opted to go to an alternator. However, that just kind of doesn't match the tractor. Okay, here I see my, this is my oil filter. Now this is a uh, line that's carrying engine coolant to the pressure regulator because obviously as I go from a liquid to a vapor there at the pressure regulator, what happens is I'm going to need lots of heat energy and I'm going to get that from the flow of coolant. So I have liquid coolant there from the engine cooling system going to my metering valve. And what happens on here on this side, there's the coolant line going back and in fact, I'm coming up here to another, what looks like pressure regulator, where I'm actually have the high pressure lines going to the tank. 
I noticed the interesting cup link here from the what looks like the clutch housing to the input of the transmission. And I do have a hydraulic pump. Uh, it looks like a type of power steering pump, but this is the hydraulic pump. And I believe this is actually the oil fill for the engine right here. This is just the gear train driving the hydraulic pump. And here are the hydraulic valve. And I can be used this hydraulic pressure to, to lift the um, mechanism there in the back for the plow or whatever equipment that I'm using. And as I look at my ignition system, I have a classic battery ignition system. Breaker point, condenser, ignition coil, and my ballast resistor, which sometimes is actually in the form of a wire, where the resistor is actually a resistance wire. So limits current. So here, if I turn the key on and the breaker points are closed, then what happens is I limit current through the primary winding of the ignition coil. It's going to get warm, but not too warm. Okay, here we see a 1962 Lamborghini Model 1 car. So, there we go. Now, this Lamborghini tractor is using a classic Bosch injector pump. Obviously, this is a two-cylinder tractor, and as I look at it, it's actually a air-cooled tractor. Sure enough, air-cooled tractor do not have a radiator. Now, obviously, this is going to be very popular in Europe, but certainly it'd be a rarity here in America. One thing I do like about it is I have my classic European automotive style generator, and there's my starter motor. And here is my cooling fan. Obviously, if this is air cooled, I need a nice belt driven fan that's going to blast air across the cooling fins on my cylinder heads and my cylinders. And we'll take a look, quick look at that on the other side. So here we see our little push rod tubes. And this looks a little bit like the Volkswagen right here. And here is the duct from the fan blasting the air as the fan directs the air, directs it from the other side. And so this is actually the exhaust. So this is going to be the hot air coming out on its way to just simply exiting the vehicle. And there I see my muffler, which doesn't look like much of a muffler. One thing that's very aggravating with a tractor is you want a quiet tractor. A noisy tractor is very hard to operate and use. And what do I see here? This is just simply a hand type pump there to prime the injector pump. Now normally the injector pump has a transfer pump in it so that it will um, uh, circulate through a uh, fuel through the cavity and then to the plungers. Many injector pumps are actually lubricated with engine oil. So I have two separate chambers. I have one chamber that's going to be the engine oil and then the other chamber up here, the actual diesel fuel that's pressurized and directed to the injectors. There with my uh, individual pistons and cam followers going against the, the cam. And uh, here on this one, here is my fuel going through the fuel filter there to the injector pump. And then this is actually a return going back to the tank. Okay, here we have a 1966 Alice Chalmers D21 Series 2. And uh, here's the uh, inline six-cylinder diesel engine. Let's take a look at its injection equipment. Okay, here we see the Stanodyne injector pump. And this is uh, very much like the Rusa Master. Of course, it is a Rusa Master. And uh, there they normally have the model. It's a little hard to read on that uh, on the plate. Here's a window where I can actually inspect the cam ring. Let's see, now I do not have a advanced mechanism on this cam ring, at least here on the bottom, I sure don't. So this is not going to have that nice feature of being able to vary the injector pump timing utilizing the repositioning of the cam ring. I have a, a plunger, or I should say two plungers that are forced together by two rollers that are being driven inside the cam ring 
and uh, here as the rotor lines up with the corresponding port and the plungers are forced together I pressurize the fuel and direct it to the corresponding injector. This has a fuel shutoff solenoid. This is going to be my lever. And now it does have a centrifugal governor. It's a centrifugal governor, but what happens is I have an idle and a full load position. And uh, uh, a maximum RPM is obviously governed, and of course as they drop it to idle, it's going to work hard to hold it there at that idle speed. So uh, there we see the standardized injector pump. It does have a vein type pump that is supplying the cavity. This is all lubricated with diesel fuel. I only have one diesel fuel filter on this model. And of course, fuel in excess of that required for the uh, fuel delivery is then directed back to the tank. The second line is coming from the return from the injectors. 